I imagine that many people in the audience are familiar with the concept of accessibility, but I still wanted to start with this quote uh, to frame it. So the development of sustainable urban transport systems requires a conceptual leap. The purpose of transportation and mobility is to gain access to destinations, activities, service, and goods. Thus, access is the ultimate objective of all transportation. Um, and this was laid out in the UN Habitat Global Report on Human Settlements. And it's not a brand new idea, but it's gaining a lot more traction, particularly, I think, because we have data to start to measure this concept um, and think more about it. But with this idea that what we want for sustainable cities is high access, then gets into the question of how do we operationalize that concept, how do we measure it, and then if we measure it, what measures are useful in policy making. Um, I like these two images just because the top, I think, is a great example of very high access, very low mobility. You can't travel quickly here, um, but you are able to get to many, a large number of opportunities. Where the picture below, travel speeds are very high, but um, there's not a lot in the immediate vicinity that you can access. We measure and visualize accessibility in Nairobi by mode. For the modes, it's walking, paratransit, and driving using three different metrics, a mobility measure, a contour measure, and a gravity measure. And then we compare the results across uh, different residential types. I want to um, start with a little terminology. When I talk about accessibility, I'm talking about um, place-based access. So the level of access at a location, not what um, is related to individual characteristics. So we can talk more about this at the end. I think that there's a lot of opportunities in this field um, as this field is growing, but in this work, we're talking about place-based accessibility. Um, the second note is when I say paratransit, I'm referring to the Matatu network, a picture here, um, which is the informal, semi-formal uh, bus system, 15 seaters typically, where if you've been to, I mean, they have, there's paratransit, there's this semi-formal, informal um, type of transit in the US too, but very common to cities in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, um, and really providing the backbone of transport in these cities. So the context of Nairobi, where, where accessibility studies have his, um, typically been conducted, most are US, UK, Canada, because there's data available there. Um, Nairobi gives us this great opportunity, uh, very data-rich opportunity to actually use these measures. But then when we use these measures in the context where they typically haven't been used, what other things do we see? What do we learn about how urbanization is happening different in these cities, how um, transport acts differently in these cities? Uh, so to highlight a couple um, aspects of Nairobi that are important and probably different from where accessibility measures are often used are paratransit being really the backbone of the public transport system. Um, there haven't been many studies measuring accessibility on a paratransit system, so we don't, this work helps to show what access looks like from a system that is um, flexible, routes, stops, um, and just puts numbers on, on what's going on there. A second um, characteristic um, to highlight about the Nairobi context is mode share. The Matatus or bus make up 41% of trips taken in Nairobi. Walking is 39%, while private vehicle and other modes are about 20%, a little less than 20%. So where in the US we are talking about mode choice, in Nairobi we might not be talking about a choice. So um, Deborah Salen and co-authors have a really interest, have a great paper where uh, they talk, they put choice in parentheses or high, quotations, and really say uh, through household surveys that low-income households don't have a choice on what mode to use. They are constrained, financially constrained, and they walk. That's the only mode affordable. Or lower middle income are often taking matatu, and that's what's affordable. So here. Doing an accessibility study in this context, we know that we're going to have to look at all three modes to be able to say what's really going on for the population that lives there. And at the same time, modes are highly correlated to income. So even though we're using place-based measures that don't take into account individual constraints, because income level is so highly correlated with the mode people are using, we can begin to talk about 
inequalities and are we building the kind of equitable city that is that we desire and then the last bit is about um, residential development Nairobi has a different historical context uh, that could inform the way the city is developing and that may be very diff different than um, what we see in most of these accessibility studies in the UK and US not many people have paired access measures with residential quality. So this work does that um, to show a little bit, see what more we can say about how the city's working. So how do we do this? Um, we start, I'm not gonna go into all the details about the travel time data, but we start with a huge data undertaking of scraping data um, to get travel time across a grid for each of the modes that we're looking at. So we have a, we grid the city, in a, roughly one kilometer by one kilometer grid cells. We take each origin point and we query um, how long it takes to get to different destination points. So some of this is, the paratransit is thanks to the digital Matatus project that made open and available GTFS data that we can use um, to create the travel times. We also use um, the Google distance, distance matrix interface as well as MapQuest interface. Um, this data, the code is on GitHub and we're making it open through Zenodo. So if anyone wants to use that data, happy to work with you to help make it more useful. With all this travel time data, then how do we actually quantify access, accessibility? They said we use three different measures. The first is what we're calling mobility measure. And this um, is pretty simple. It just counts the number of other grid points that can be reached in 60 minutes from uh, the origin grid point. When we create the travel time data, we do it at the morning peak, so 7 to 9 a.m. Um, and while we were doing the study, Google started putting historical um, traffic data, uh, starting putting historical traffic data online too. So when we do the driving measure, we actually incorporate what they say historical congestion is at the morning peak. The Matatu data, we use the morning peak um, but it's not, the Matatu data isn't real-time data, um, but it was collected on board vehicles, so it captures at least somewhat the driving characteristics. So this more simple measure tells you in, about the characteristics of the transport system. It hasn't, doesn't tell you anything about the land use system, but how many other places in the city can you reach in 60 minutes? So our second measure is when we start to incorporate uh, land use information. And, what we use specifically are the location of health facilities. So in the contour measure, uh, this measure counts the number of health facilities that you can reach in 60 minutes from your origin point across the three different modes. A kind of simple schematic of how this works, if you're at point I is the origin, in 60 minutes you can travel to all of the grid cells in yellow orange and then each red um, f is a, each red image is a health facility so in this the contour measure would be three you can reach three health facilities in 60 minutes it's pretty simplistic but it's easy to communicate um, and what we then do for the next measure is um, this counts equally locations that are one minute from you versus 59 minutes from you. So in the gravity measure, we add a negative exponential that weights um, the health facilities by the time it takes you to get there. So it's essentially a penalty for locations that are further away. And we also calculate the impedance parameter, so it's specific for each mode, and that's from uh, real travel, travel trip sur surveys. And so what do we find? Uh, these maps are by, the first column is walking, middle is paratransit, and the column closest to me is driving. And on the top row, it's the mobility measure. The middle row is the contour measure, and the bottom row is the gravity measure. Uh, so some first points to highlight. When we move from measuring accessibility in the mobility measure 
to measuring it in the contour and gravity measure, which take into account the spatial distribution of health facilities throughout the city, we start to see the um, huge advantage of the central city, specifically for walking. So what does that, what does that mean for low-income individuals who are constrained to use walking that don't live there? They, they can't reach a health facility in 60 minutes. Um, if you're a policymaker and you think just about mobility, you don't see the same, um, the same limitations if you aren't accounting for where, um, how land use interacts with transportation. So the next point is looking from mobility or the walking to paratransit. In the paratransit um, maps, we start to see the outline of the Matatu network. Access is higher where the service is. Another point is that the, the scale of these maps, it's logarithmic. So this is a magnitude increase in accessibility when you move from walking to using paratransit. The same is then true um, that there's a magnitude increase when you move from paratransit to driving. So for driving, um, much of the city is accessible. You don't have the same drastic difference from being near the CBD versus being um, further out. You can reach most health facilities um, or other good points by, by car. So another way that we're presenting this presenting this data is through these cumulative distribution plots. So on the horizontal axis, it's the le or horizontal access, ax axis, it's the level of access. Um, so you see in the mobility measure, it's number of grid points, and in the contour and gravity measure, it's number of health facilities. Then um, what's graphed is the percent of um, other uh, observations within the data that can reach, that have that level of access or higher. So if you go across at 50%, you're going to see the same, you're going to see the means in the um, summary statistics table at the bottom. So these two are showing the same, essentially same information in different ways. What I want to highlight from this is if you take the paratransit versus the driving um, lines, so the two middle lines in each graph. If you're looking at mobility, you see that they're pretty drastically different. Once you start to take into account um, the location of health facilities and the contour and gravity measures, those two lines become closer and closer to each other. In numbers, so that means that in the mobility measure, the level of access by paratransit is 15% as high as car. So decision maker, it look, the car dominates when you think about accessibility in those in mobility numbers. In the contour measure, mobility level of access by paratransit is 29% as high as by automobile, while in the gravity measure, paratransit access is now 50% um, as high as automobile. So depending on how you measure it, you're going to come to very different answers about what, what modes are useful. So here, the paratransit line looks closer to driving than to walking. So if you want to talk about access, one of the things, if you want to use these measures for policy, the way you measure it, you're going to come out to different policy decisions. So making sure that you, um, making sure that we think deeply about how we're measuring what we're presenting in data across different modes can have a lot of difference in which modes you value and how, how good of a job you would say they're doing providing access. So this is, this is just a brief summary. Um, the, central, the CBD is particularly advantageous, particularly if you're constrained to walking. And paratransit provides comparatively, comparatively better access when health facilities are incorporated. So the next uh, part we wanted to do was look at how does level, levels of access compare to types of residential development? And here, um, we use a data set from UN Habitat's Global Water Operators Partnership Alliance. Uh, they had a pilot project looking at access to water. Uh, I didn't create this data, but the way they did it is using remote sensing imagery. They uh, classified different um, residential plots based on number of physical characteristics, such as plot size, amount of green space, 
um, footprint of the building. And then they went and did um, surveys stratified by the different types that they'd identified in the remote sensing data. And so we're also able to capture household information like income. Um, we then take their classifications of different income groups and use seven categories from very high to very low. So I'll talk about re very high residential level, but that's ordered by income. These are examples of uh, pictures of types of residential developments in each of these categories. So the highest type are the very large, um, large houses in gated communities. Uh, all the way through, we have the medium type is a lot of the downtown um, apartment buildings. To the very low type are the slums. What we then, this is how they map out across the city. Um, we see the very high types, a lot of the gated communi communities are um, being developed on the western part of the city. And where it says Nairobi, that's the CBD. What we do is we take uh, the each residential plot, the grid cell that it falls in, we assign it that access measure. And this is how the um, contour-based access to health facilities varies by residential level across the three different modes. So some of the trends we're seeing are that the very low, which are the slum developments, have the highest level, have very high levels of walking across all three modes, while the very high level um, has lowest levels of access across the three different modes. As you saw, there's definite trends in terms of distance from CBD, and we already know CBD is where high access is. So we run a regression controlling for distance from the central business district. We run a regression of residential level on um, contour-based access to health facilities controlling for distance to the CBD. So um, given residential level at the same distance, which one is more likely to have higher access? Um, and the medium level is our um, reference level. So all of these will now be, um, these results will be in reference to the medium level. So this is the regression table, and this is it shown visually. The, um, what you can see from the, or first of all, this shows you the number of health facilities reachable in 60 minutes for a one kilometer change in distance to CBD. So CBD is on the horizontal axis here. First of all, the downward slope is showing you that the contour measure is lower on average for locations further away. Um, and that the average slope is steepest for paratransit than for driving, than for walking. So that means your access falls off faster by paratransit the further you get from the CBD. And that makes sense given the um, how the routes go. The routes, the Matatu routes come into the CBD, you can transfer here and you go out. So you lose access by paratransit more, more quickly the further away you go. But some of the points that I want to highlight are these are on the same um, scale now. So you can see this um, comparative advantage of paratransit over walking, drastically so. So moving from walking to paratransit gives you 10 times higher access on average. Um, then going from paratransit to driving, that change is only a 1.4 increase. So if you want to give the most access to the most people, you would try to get you would try to switch from walking to paratransit, right? If you want to give the highest level of access, then you switch to driving. Does that make sense? This really helps highlight um, some, some findings that we, we were somewhat surprised about. So the medium low category, what you see is that for all modes, it's very high magnitude and highly significant. So this medium, low cat, this medium low residential type just has extremely high levels of access. We also see that this very high residential type has very low levels of access. So what we're talking about for this um, very high levels, again, those are the gated communities. 
it may not be a preference for access, there could be a preference for seclusion. The people that can afford to live wherever they want are living somewhere where the access is lowest. That tells us something about the preferences of people in the city, and if we move to an access accessibility planning paradigm, it, we need to be cognizant of some of those preferences that might play out. Um, is that the ideal for everyone, or what does it mean if, if you allow that, if cities allow for that type of development to happen? Um, at the same time, those are the people that can very easily afford a car. So do, can they live far away because they now have, they have high access because they have a car? This medium low type um, is characterized by tenement style buildings. And I want to give a, um, Hertzsemeyer has a really nice paper about um, these large scale tenement buildings where they find that 5,000, the density at which people are living is 5,242 persons per hectare. So that's in comparison to 19th century New York where density was 1,100. So we're, people are living at density five times higher than the tenements on the Lower East Side. This could be very logical. People make, people make smart decisions based on their tastes and preferences and constraints. We're finding that the residential type that has that is just astronomically higher levels of access. So there's this trade-off happening between, we think that there's this trade-off happening between residential quality um, and transportation access. Um, none of this is people that live in cities, people that make decisions about where to live. All of these can make sense. All of these, these types of decisions make sense, but this work is really the exploratory study of fleshing out those details, putting them, um, capturing them on paper. First, a summary, and then I'll go into the limitations. So these findings show how place-based access um, calculated for mobility measure, contour measure, and gravity measure vary spatially across the city. Um, also how they vary across modes. It makes explicit the relationship between the residential developments and physical access to health. Um, and we find significant variation in, in accessibility across residential levels when we use these residential levels based on neighborhood characteristics and ordered by income. So on to the limitations of this study. I'm one of the best at talking about all the shortcomings, so happy to break. I'm great at destroying my own research, so happy to talk all about the limitations. But um, I, these estimates don't capture any constraints that individuals face. This is entirely just the, the physical transport system and location of buildings. Those uh, limitations that individuals face are incredibly important. Understanding more about financial constraints, understanding more about taste and preferences, understanding about um, physical disabilities or um, cultural or gender differences also inhibit tr access. We're not capturing that here, but that's important and um, the next steps of any kind of research like this, or maybe even the first steps. Of, um, but what we can say is just because of the relationship across modes residences and income levels, we can in this work talk about spatial inequality. We can talk about if, if access to walking is such and we know the average characteristics of who's walking, w that begins to um, lead into a conversation about what's equitable for a city and is this equitable, is this what, um, how a city wants to develop. The second limitation is the lack of high quality land use data. We talked a little bit about why we use health facilities um, because access to health is important as well as because it's um, the data quality is there. Uh, but in cities like this, having more information on that land use data would tell us many more richness of what's happening. Um, the next is the reality of traveling in Nairobi. For anyone who's been there, if you've walked, it's not, it's not, in some places it's not fun to walk. Um, so these are just some pictures from when we were last there. Like we're using it based on routes that Google Maps and MapQuest query and say there uh, you can walk there, which is all, pretty much all roads. But then the reality on the ground is, is not going to look like that. Um, so when we calculate, when we estimate the impedance parameter, it's twice as high for walking as the other modes. And that's based on the distribution of trips people take by time. 
So there's, there's huge deterrents to walking that aren't even being captured in this work. Um, at the same time, we're not capturing walking paths th that Google and MapQuest don't have, um, which also exists. And second is other, other aspects in the reality of traveling, such as specific communities just banning matatus, um, or um, police stops or other things that happen when in actual travel. Um, and finally, there, I think there's a, and finally, there's definitely a lot more that can go into capturing true access to health. For example, ability to pay, quality of facility. We use all facilities as a proxy for um, spatial distribution, but um, quantifying access to the best hospital or um, what you can reach given physical limitations or in the time required, um, that's not within this study, but is very important. If, if you want to use this for actually, if you want to use this as actual access to health, don't. <laughs> um, but if you do, much more work needs to go into understanding that. So finally, just the, the implications of this work. This was an exploratory study talking about place-based access with the data that's being created in cities like this. What can we start to look at? And then um, the next step would be how, how can this be used as a policy tool? So in this work, um, we can start to see how inequality is reflected in the physical infrastructure. There's not the same stories necessarily in Nairobi that accessibility work in the US shows. Um, there's a very different historical development. The tenement, the tenement style buildings actually developed as often um, railway worker communities. So the history of colonialization has very different ways that the city is playing out. Um, and that changes levels of access today. Um, we hope that this work raises questions about who the city is being built for and how to design it, how to come back to that first quote at the beginning of what, how we could use access measures to make the city um, sustainable in the way we, we want it to going forward. Um, and finally, can, the, can these kind of tools be used to change the discussion about um, how we plan transport land use relationship. Um, so please feel free to email me. I have a paper. I'd be happy to share the paper. It's um, under revise and resubmit, so it's not yet rejected from a journal. I'm happy to give you a draft of it. <laughs> and thank you for having me today. <laughs>